He was freakishly tall. Sometimes from our own officers, sometimes just from terrorists. 
of our adversaries. Uh, a fourth and related kind of intelligence is called measurements and signals. This is largely having to do with the technical aspect of military hardware and weapon systems. You know, every time a missile is tested, it sends uh, various kinds of electrical sig electronic signals back to the home station, saying how it's flying, what it's doing, how it's operating. You can take that approach, obviously, and have a pretty good insight into what your adversary is doing to collect so to advance their military. Uh, a fifth kind of intelligence that we collect is so called geospatial intelligence. Uh, this pretty simply just analyzing things about the Earth's surface. Uh, it's a long time ago, that was done by hot air balloons, and then we did it by aircraft like the U 2, and now we obviously do it by satellites. And then, six, an increasingly important kind of intelligence is called open source. What people just put out there in public. You'd be surprised at how often our adversaries tell us exactly what they're going to do. This is not news. I mean, Adolf Hitler, for instance, told us exactly what his plans were in the book that anybody could have picked up and read about the United States. But in today's world, with social media proliferating, not just in the United States, but around the world, we can garner a lot of insight into what our adversaries are doing simply, simply by looking at social media or reading the internet or so forth. If a young Russian or Chinese or Iranian soldier posts a picture of him drilling in a certain area, that tells our uh, intelligence officers and our military a lot of about a lot about what those countries may be intending. So those are the, the six kinds of intelligence you can play. I, I don't want to click there because that is the defining the defining characteristic of an intelligence agency is the information you can collect. Everything else an intelligence agency does is important, but that is the defining characteristic. Because without that intelligence, they're just like you or me. Without those classified secrets they could be sitting a newspaper or a magazine or a university writing and analyzing what's available to all of us. Now, because the, because the analysts in our intelligence agencies are backed up with that classified information, they are much more than that. And the analysis they produce is penetrating and insightful. The expertise they bring to bear is very rich and thorough. They can do that in written memos, in, in visual aids, in maps, uh, in all kinds of things to bring to bear their expertise and that classified information on the decisions that policymakers <coughs> face, whether you're the president or the cabinet secretary or senator or congressman and so forth. And the analysis that is produced by our intelligence community, I can tell you, I read it every week, is simply top notch. The third kind of thing that intelligence services do, and again, anytime, anywhere, is <coughs> covert action or covert operations. Now again, this is the stuff that is really made famous by movies and books and so forth. Um, but there is some misperception about covert operations as well. You know, oftentimes in the movies it involves, you know, dark guns with pointed hit arrows, people hanging off the sides of airplanes, diving deep in the water the way you see in Mission Impossible. And there are programs like that. You know, many of them have been declassified. Uh, we had a massive covert operation in Afghanistan in the 1970s and the 1980s, starting under Jimmy Carter and going up with Ronald Reagan, where we provided massive amounts of arms and other aids to the insurgents fighting the Soviet occupation there, which ultimately helped defeat that occupation, which helped contribute to the collapse of the Soviet Union. So there is that kind of, of lethal <laughs> operation. But there are many, many non-lethal kinds of covert operations as well. So in the Cold War, for instance, uh, the intel our, our intelligence agencies conducted major printing operations, printing the writings of Soviet dissidents in the small books, you know, the size of, you know, maybe five, that would then be smuggled in to the Soviet Union, that were otherwise banned. Often conducted radio operations, things that don't put anyone's lives at risk, but try to advance our policy goals, try to undermine the interests of our adversaries. Oftentimes, these could, these don't have to be conducted by an intelligence service. They could be conducted by our military. They could be conducted by the Department of State or some other civilian agency. But they are done by an intelligence service, in large part, at the request of our allies, countries that want our cooperation for one reason or another, either external threat in their region or internal unrest in their country. They don't want to be seen openly cooperating with the United States, or that the very fact of U.S. cooperation would undermine the goals we're trying to achieve. For instance, in printing the works of Soviet dissidents and publishing them back into the Soviet Union. 
if those dissidents had been associated in any way with the United States, it would have undermined the credibility of their own word, their own testimony against the tyranny that was the Soviet Union. So that's one reason why our intelligence agencies tend to conduct covert action. One reason why other countries do as well, because the governments that are conducting them don't want it to be publicly acknowledged. And sometimes their allies don't want it to be publicly acknowledged either. A fourth and final function that any intelligence service anywhere and everywhere has to do is counterintelligence. Uh, this is more than a defensive function. It's about protecting your own information, protecting your own security. And in fact, it's like that is, you know, reminds me of being in the Army. One of the core principles of patrolling as an instrument is security. Now, security is not going to achieve your goal. It's not going to help you conduct an ambush or, or a raid or, or win a tank battle because it's all defensive. However, if you're not secure, you can't go out and complete that military operation. The same thing is true with counterintelligence. If you think the, your adversary's intelligence services may have penetrated your intelligence agencies with moles, that they may have tapped into your phone lines, that they may be monitoring your communications, you can't achieve your goals while they're achieving their goals. Obviously, that has happened in our country's history, uh, cases like Alter Gen Alter Gen Alter Gen, for instance. So those are, those are the four big things that any intelligence service does. Whether it's the United States, whether it's another country, whether it's today, or whether it's 500 years ago or 2,000 years ago. <coughs> Likewise, any country today has three basic kinds of intelligence services. There's three basic kinds of intelligence services that conduct those three, those four kinds of activities. Put simply, an external, an internal, and a signal service. So for us, those big three are the CIA and the FBI and the NSA. Now, Signals, obviously, is much bigger now than it was 100 years ago. It didn't exist 200 years ago. But for time out of mind, there's been an external and internal service. The external service is the service that is stealing secrets overseas. It's going overseas to recruit spies, to tap into phone lines, to in-place listening devices, and so forth. The, the internal service, oftentimes resembling and oftentimes carried out as it is here by a police organization, is primarily responsible for counterintelligence, is primarily responsible for plots against our homeland. So while the CIA is conducting its mission overseas and does not conduct operations in the United States, the FBI is responsible for much more than what most people think, which is oftentimes drug crimes, <coughs> kidnapping or financial crimes or so forth. That's you know, kind of the LAS model of the FBI. But the FBI also does all their counterintelligence work. They're the ones that monitor terrorist threats here. They're the ones who track operatives of the Islamic State or identify those who might be communicating with the Islamic State in Syria over the internet, radicalizing to the point where they may conduct terrorist attack here. They're the ones who are examining whether people inside the government or people who are at critical laboratories or universities around the world are being co-opted and recruited by foreign intelligence services. Again, this is true all around the world. Some countries combine them. The old Soviet Union had one KGB. The KGB had different directorates that had an external component. One had an internal component. But every country has an external and an internal service. And then finally, the reason more than they had about, as I mentioned earlier, is your signal service. Our signal service in this country is the National Security Agency. Again, all they simply do is monitor electronic communications of our adversaries. They're responsible for trying to intercept telephone calls or emails or satellite communication or radio communications. And in a world where those are increasingly important, and in some countries where it's very hard to conduct any other kind of intelligence activity, like say North Korea, because Americans generally don't get admitted to those countries, your signal service is increasingly important all around the world. Now, there's obviously a lot more to our intelligence community than just those three agencies. In fact, we have 17 intelligence agencies that make up the intelligence community. Sometimes you'll hear the big five, not the big three. The other two are the National Reconnaissance Office, which designs and launches and operates our satellites that are in space, and the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, the NGA, they conduct a lot of the geospatial analysis I was talking about earlier, using our satellites, identifying what's happening on the Earth's surface. Um, but the big three that any country will have, a lot of countries don't have that kind of satellite architecture, is the external, the internal.
terminal and, and the signal service. In addition to those two others, we have the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence, that was created in the aftermath of 9 11. Uh, it's primarily a coordinating and supervising role, it doesn't have a collection role. So it manages the internal processes of the other 16 agencies. It, kind of, it helps coordinate and synthesize, harmonize a lot of the information that is collected throughout the intelligence world to make sure that all the agencies are speaking to each other, that all streams of information, whether it's a highly sensitive human source, or whether it's a passenger manifest, or whether it's a Facebook stream, is woven together so policy can make, make a significant <coughs> picture. And then the, the other 11 services are all kind of speci specialized services that help the particular agencies or departments will serve. The military, the Department of State, Department of Justice, Department of Energy, Department of Treasury, uh, they all perform important functions. Some of them are very important and only they can do that, but they are very particularly focused on the mission of those departments. So that's the intelligence community. That's what they do, and that's how they do it. Uh, but there's also one other important player in the world of intelligence, and that's Congress. Now, it didn't, used to always be quite like this. Uh, we had a major change in the way the intelligence world works in the United States around 1975. Um, Congress began to take a more assertive role. It created the intelligence committees in both the House and the Senate. It began to have a greater oversight and greater action and greater collection effort. So before 1975, the CIA really was, for instance, the president's CIA. Since then, I think it's fair to say they're equal partners. And it's very important work that's, that's done through Congress with the intelligence world, and it's their way to ensure that government agencies that have to be inherently secret are democratically accountable as well. Two main ways that happens. First is the so-called gang of agents. That is the congressional leadership that has access to the most sensitive information or sometimes advanced notice of what the Senate and uh, House Intelligence Committees will know. So that's the Republican and Democratic leaders in the House and Senate and two committees. So today that would be Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer in the Senate, Paul Ryan, Nancy Pelosi in the House, Richard Burr and Mark Warner on the Senate Intelligence Committee, and Kevin Nunez and Adam Schiff on the House Intelligence Committee. Again, it's a very limited amount of information that they get that the remainders of the committees don't have. Oftentimes, it's advanced notice of a covert operation that is underway. Sometimes it's particularly sensitive source or method, uh, the identity of which is critical to analyze the intelligence community's judgments and to conduct oversight, but which is being too sensitive to expand to the broader committees. But again, it's a very small slice of what Congress knows. Much broader information is known by the intelligence committees. I've been on the Senate Intelligence Committee now. I was elected to the Senate a little over two years ago. Rick Crawford, your congressman, was, was appointed to the House Intelligence Committee uh, in this Congress. I can tell you, even though it doesn't look like it, since we do all of our work in private, it's the hardest working committee in Congress, and where I do most of my work, and where I put in the longest hours. We meet twice a week, which by Senate standards is actually a lot of work <laughs> compared to some other committees. Uh, but it's much more than that as well. Uh, it's consistent briefings visits to the agencies all around Washington, D.C., travel overseas to meet our professionals all around the world, uh, since, as with the military, you can only get a full and complete picture of what's happening overseas in the world by being on the front lines, talking to those people who are walking on the front lines of freedom all around the world. Uh, we're not an operational committee. In the same way that you wouldn't expect the Judiciary Committee to be investigating crimes, you wouldn't expect the Armed Services Committee to be conducting battles or dictating formations during battles. We're an oversight committee. You know, we don't conduct covert operations. We're not deployed around the world. We don't we don't set the policy unilaterally. But we do oversight these things. We probe and ask questions about the quality of collection that these agencies are doing. Where are the gaps that we don't have, that we're missing? Why are we missing them? We probe the quality of analysis. Are the facts that you presented really adequate to justify these conclusions? Is there an alternative explanation? Is there an alternative conclusion you might reach based on the facts you presented us? We oversee covert operations, which is one of the biggest changes 
in the 1975 reform. <laughs> the president authorizes them, but Congress has to fund them. And I can tell you that Congress doesn't always go along with the president's wishes. And that goes back to every president since 1975. More broadly, we're responsible for the long-term health of our intelligence community, their budgets, their personnel, their management, their leadership, their culture, to ensure that they're doing the right thing, that they are playing within the lines set out by law and set out by policymakers, but also playing up to the line to do everything they can to keep our country safe. And I'll conclude with this observation that based on a little more than two years of all those briefings on Capitol Hill, all those trips out to intelligence agencies, in particular trips around the world, I have met hundreds and hundreds of intelligence professionals. And you might ask, who are these people? What are they like? Are they like Maxwell Smart or Jason Bourne? Or Stephen Hawk? Not exactly. I can tell you who they are like that. They're just like you. They're like all of us. In fact, it's very common for someone to walk up to me in an agency or an embassy and introduce themselves and say they're from Arkansas. Because they come from every walk of life. Their moms and dads, all races, all backgrounds, all ages, all physical abilities, high school degrees, advanced scientific PhDs. <coughs> the one thing that unites all of them is they are dedicated, patriotic public servants who, because they work in the shadows, don't get enough recognition from the American people. So, on their behalf, I would ask you just to conclude by thinking about the service and sacrifice they render to you and say a prayer for them tonight. You've got a tough job. We often do it under very adverse conditions. Thank you all. God bless you. God bless you.
to your question about meeting with the Russian ambassador, the answer is no. To my knowledge, they've never asked me. If they did, I would. I've met with dozens of ambassadors. Uh, that's part of the job that Arkansans send me to do. I've met with dozens of heads of state, both in the, uh, here in the United States and traveling around the country, around the world as well. And then finally, you asked about all the other uh, reported contacts between Trump associates uh, and Russian intelligence officers. I know there's been a lot of media reports about that. Um, I would simply say, based on a lot of knowledge, that you should not believe allegations in the media based on anonymous sources. You should not believe them. That doesn't mean they're all false, and that doesn't mean they shouldn't be properly reviewed by the right people, which in many cases is part of the, the intelligence committees of the Congress or the FBI, but you simply should not credit what anonymous sources allege in news stories. The one thing you should believe in those news stories, the one thing, the one thing you should believe in any news story based on anonymous sources is the caveat that undermines the claims of the headline and the first paragraph. receiving insurance services through the private option Medicaid expansion under the ACA. You also have approximately several hundred thousand additional constituents who are receiving subsidies to receive to purchase their health insurance. Can you tell us how you will assure all those constituents that they will continue to have a level of care comparable to what they have now at a rate they can afford? Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much for the question. I, I know that, that your health care has created a lot of anxiety and stress, even under the best times. Uh, and what I want to do for our Kansans, not just the several hundred thousand you mentioned, but all three million, is to try to make their health care more affordable and personalized, put them in control so they can afford it, they can make their own decisions and to reduce the amount of red tape and bureaucratic uh, decision-making they face so they don't have that stress and anxiety. Now, you mentioned some particular features of Obamacare. Look, I, I will not dispute that some people have been helped by Obamacare. Many more Americans, though, have been hurt by it. By rising premiums, by high deductibles, by loss of access to doctors and hospital and clinic networks. There are some counties in the state where it takes $1,000 a month to get your premium, and then there's another $6,000 deductible. That means you spend $18,000 in a year before you actually access your insurance benefits. If people had $18,000 laying around in Arkansas, they wouldn't have to worry about the insurance in the first place. <coughs> so what, what we'll, we'll do with the repeal of Obamacare is to try to give individuals more choice and more control over the health care that they get, Mandates, penalties, fewer mandated benefits, less red tape, more individual decision making. What does that look like? You know, so Obamacare said you have to have a certain level of coverage covering certain benefits. Something that's never been done by the federal government before. More appropriately done at the state level. Well, we can take account for the particular circumstances of Arkansas and the three million people we have here in our state. That causes insurance rates to rise. Obamacare has controls on the way you can access networks and the quality of insurance you can get. Again, causing insurance rates to rise for everyone, whether you get your insurance through an Obamacare exchange or you get it through private insurance. Those are just a couple examples of the ways that we can bring down the price of insurance for everyone. For those people who need a financial hand, rather than trying to pay subsidies based on your income and various other factors, all of which can change at any given time, we're gonna propose tax credits that empower you to make the decisions that you want. The same kind of benefits that people who get their insurance do employers have to make their own decisions for themselves. Medicaid is indeed a bigger reform. You know, Medicaid has real problems before Obamacare. A lot of people in this room probably know that if you're on traditional Medicaid, it's hard to even see a doctor because of the low price of reimbursement. What they want, what I think Medicaid should be, is go to the safety net, people who are much vulnerable, the blind, the severely disabled, the elderly, and so forth. And it should help fill the gap for people who, because of limited financial means, may not be able to cover enough of their premium through the tax credit side I think with the kind of health care system that doesn't just repeal Obamacare, but fixes the problems we had long before Obamacare. And that's where our focus is going to be. As we all know, we live in a dangerous world today, and it may be, it gets more dangerous day by day. And we, we hear about uh, major attacks 
ideas that are out there to make us safer? Did you see an acceleration of things that are going to help us be safe? And could you just comment on it, please? Uh, so, this is my final thing. in the trunk of a car over 20 years ago. Um, there, um, there's a wall being built, or there's going to be built, you know, according to, the, uh, to President Trump. And I'm just wondering how we plan on affording that wall whenever we don't even have, when we can't even subsidize money for healthcare. Um, on top of that, I just want to state that if your family is uh, in danger, a wall's not gonna stop anyone. Thank you. 
we first put the box in charge of the hen house, and we all breathe air, and we all need water. So what can you say that can help us to feel that perhaps all is not lost as far as our environment?